I have history third. Yeah. Got a message for yourself, Dean? Nihilism is the first step in the existential awakening. Sonder and nihilism share this step because the unlearned existentialist has no choice but to come to a fierce rejection of meaning when faced with the crippling implications of not only their limited time, but also their limited impact. What's Sonder? Well, we'll get to that. In a billion years, the sun will have grown large enough to have swallowed the earth, making every physical piece of matter that you once were into something less than dust, something less than ash, something unquantifiable and unrecoverable. You, everything you love, every reminder of your uniqueness will be gone long before this billion year milestone, as your bones lay buried in a cemetery in a future where your great 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 grandchildren don't even know your name. Nobody has carried on the stories of who you were. Your home, if it's still standing, has been scraped clean of your residence and sold to someone else, someone just as certain of their importance and self-asserted uniqueness as you once were. You're no longer here to determine what is meaningful and what is not, and you will no longer exist, no longer able to scowl at the world for leaving you behind, no longer able to reminisce on what once made your life so worth living, no longer able to watch passively as the earth continued rotating and the years churned on with nobody lastingly grieving your departure. You will no longer exist. This is the final step of existence. And this is the first step of the existential awakening. There are few words in the English language that effectively capture the scope and weight of an existential crisis, which, sorry if I just gave you one right now. Depressed has been used ad nauseum. Heavy doesn't quite capture it, but I like suffocating. It's not fatal per se, it's survivable, but it is truly all-encompassing. Sudden Thoughts of Death Barbie was a glimpse into the mind of someone suffocating under the shifting sands of time. Yet, the process of an awakening is vastly different for every person to have ever lived, and thus, we have little choice but to turn away from the established dictionary. We must turn to the indescribable. The foundational pillar of absurdism is one of inherent emptiness. In his seminal essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, Albert Camus, forefront existentialist, father of absurdism, and frankly the icon of every depressed teenager, asks, what then is that incalculable feeling that deprives the mind of the sleep necessary to life? A world that can be explained even with bad reasons is a familiar world. But on the other hand, in a universe suddenly divested of illusions and lights, man feels an alien, a stranger. His exile is without remedy since he is deprived of the memory of a lost home or the hope of a promised land. This divorce between man and this life, the actor and his setting, is properly the feeling of absurdity. Humanity is the only species we know of with knowledge of their imminent demise, superseded only by our insatiable desire to make our time worthwhile. Animals live because they avoid death at all costs, and they instinctively understand how to not die. But are we really so primal as to chalk up waking up every morning just because of survival instincts? But whenever we take a moment to stop, to think, to ask ourselves, why am I here? To beg for reason and cause, the world contains very little in the form of a rhyme. Man calls out, and the universe is silent. The absurd. You are, by nature, lonely. Author Daniel Saint once said, You cannot make everyone think and feel as deeply as you do. This is your tragedy, because you understand them, but they do not understand you. Every person who has had their first existential crisis has felt the sudden pain of learning how limited language is when expressing the root causes of cosmic isolation. 
I can tell you that I understand your sorrow, your mother's death, your cat's disappearance, your disappointment with your general state of affairs. But the truth is, the best I can do is approximate your sorrow, drawing up a rough impression of how I think I would react in your shoes. You tell me what's wrong, I run it through my own biases and experiences, I judge the severity of your situation, and I respond with sympathy that I deem to be sufficient. Even if you consider yourself an especially empathetic person, you do this subconsciously too, because that's just what everyone does. The worst day of someone's month could just be another Tuesday for you. I tell myself that everyone takes things differently, that it's not fair for me to judge your reactions and circumstances, but every metric through how I respond to your own sadness is through the lens of my own experiences. I can go into your head and directly simulate how those events affect your emotions back into my own consciousness. The best I can do is a self-centered facade, and the best anyone can do is self-centered facades. As the creator, your work will never be good enough. Outside of the world of academia, there are no GPAs or test grades to give you something close to an objective view of the merit of your work. The plight of the perfectionist is chasing an ambition that will never leave them satisfied. Thousands of paintings sold, millions of views on YouTube, being recognized in public, whatever measure of success and satisfaction based on the quality of one's work will never be enough for the true perfectionist. A sloppy brushstroke here, a word with a more impactful simile that you didn't think to use until after publishing, a flaw in a photograph that will scarcely be perceived by those who will see it through the lens of being your art. Are you overreacting, or are they not understanding the sacredness of the pursuit of art? On the back of the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows, author John Koenig described his compendium as one that, quote, defines new words for emotions that we all feel but don't have the language to express. By turns poignant, relatable, and mind-bending, the definitions include whimsical etymologies drawn from languages all over the world, interspersed with otherworldly collages and lyrical essays that explore the forgotten corners of the human condition. Sonder is a word that you may have previously come across. I mentioned it earlier in the video, and it's probably one of the most well-known words from this ensemble of half-real words and half-incommunicable emotions. And it can be defined as the realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own, populated with their own ambitions, friends, routines, worries, and inherited craziness with elaborate passageways to thousands of other lives that you'll never know exist, in which you might appear only once. Sonder is the first step in existential awakening. Suddenly, you're no longer the main character in the world, and every single living person once believed or still believes that they are just as important as you perceive yourself to be. In a world of people whom you previously believed to think in black and white, living lives of little more than dull and monotonous routines in comparison to your lofty goals and self-asserted uniqueness, you are thrust into the harsh reality that you appear just as inconsequential to them as they do to you. Through a shared transition from black and white to color, we understand the beautiful yet terrifying connotations of Sonder. You matter, and everybody else matters, because none of you matter. Nihilism means something slightly different to all of those who encounter it. The belief that life has no meaning or purpose and that all religious and moral principles have no value. The rejection of all religious and moral principles in the belief that life is meaningless. A viewpoint that traditional values and beliefs are unfounded and that existence is senseless and useless. For our purposes, let's stick to the Wikipedia definition, which is much broader in its sense of coverage of the word's extent. Nihilism is a family of values within philosophy that rejects generally accepted or fundamental aspects of human existence, such as knowledge, morality, or meaning. What nihilism really is, is a rabbit hole. Like a rabbit hole, getting lost in the drear and dread of a meaningless world is both confusing and utterly debilitating. A horrifying exercise of introspection staring into the mirror and being forced to reconcile with what you see, 
to believe that nothing truly matters, to be existentially convinced that all of the pain and pleasure of your existence chalks up to little more than a blip in history to be forgotten within a century, to reject hope out of undying allegiance to the logical and provable to the bitter end, to believe in nothing but the absence of belief. Existentialism is not a new or postmodern concept either, although the school of thought is primarily associated with thinkers like Nietzsche and Kierkegaard. Ecclesiastes 1 reads, The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Even those who lived in the face of the biblical God were at times convinced of the pointless cyclical nature of life and death. And so, to escape our timeless existential suffocation, we turn to art. When I was a younger man, art was a lonely thing. Mark Rothko sought to make paintings that would bring people to tears. His works have been described by onlookers as awe-inspiring, thought-provoking, a cause for deeper meditation, and, as mentioned, quite literally tear-inducing. Something about these canvases adorned in colored squares has proven to stand the test of time, cementing Rothko as one of the most well-remembered painters of the abstract expressionism movement. And yet, he hated that title. He hated the name abstract expressionism. He hated those who sought to commercialize his art, including the Kennedy family themselves. Famously, he was commissioned to paint murals for the Four Seasons restaurant at the Seagram Hotel. But Rothko eventually grew disgusted with the idea that his paintings would be decorative objects for wealthy diners and refunded this incredibly lucrative offer. A left-wing atheist who struggled with depression for the majority of his career, Rothko found solace in neither the capitalist world around him nor within the confines of his own mind. A few days prior to Rothko's suicide at the age of 66 in 1970, he had arranged for a massive donation to the Museum of London in the form of more than a dozen of his paintings. Near the end of his life, Rothko painted a series known as the Black on Greys, uniformly featuring just a black rectangle above a grey rectangle. These canvases have been associated with his depression and his suicide, although Rothko himself rejected the interpretations arguing instead that the paintings were a continuation of his lifelong artistic themes and not symptoms of depression. Maybe Rothko's art developed alongside him, continuing to evoke darker themes and utilizing darker colors as he continued to be drowned down by a failing marriage, worsening depression, health problems, and addiction. Despite his fame, Rothko felt a growing personal seclusion and a sense of being misunderstood as an artist fearing that people purchased his painting simply out of fashion and that the true purpose of his work was not being grasped. He wanted his paintings to move beyond abstraction, beyond classical art, as objects that possessed their own form and potential. He began refusing to entertain questions regarding the meaning of his works, instead opting to say that silence is so accurate. On February 28, 1971, at the dedication of Rothko Chapel and one year after his death, French-American art collector Dominique de Menil remarked, We are cluttered with images and only abstract art can bring us to the threshold of the divine. Noting Rothko's courage in painting, quote, impenetrable fortresses of color. Rothko had his wish granted, even if his work was often and still is largely commercialized and chalked up in simple words like basic, happy, and sad, he had created poetry, transcendental art that evoked tragedy, ecstasy, and doom, causing people to weep upon their impression of his work. Poet and acquaintance Stanley Kunitz described Rothko as a primitive, a shaman who finds the magic formula and leads people to it. But Rothko was no shaman. He was a man, an absolutely tortured man, a depressed atheist who believed in the words of Nietzsche, and channeled his despair and sense of doom into artwork that would largely be misunderstood. And yet, he continued to paint. Because art was, and still is, 
the most effective and spiritual medium for communicating what words cannot. Here, Geisel has decided to let someone mount a retrospective of his work. It's an honor to you. Yep. It certainly is. They say that lots and lots of people are going to come. Hmm? They say lots. We'll see. Sometimes they come, sometimes they don't. Modest for a man whose 45 books have sold then, more than 100 million copies in close to 20 languages. Theodore Seuss Geisel, better known as Dr. Seuss, is synonymous with childhood. Simple and often made up vocabulary, colorful and fantastical worlds, and an aura of escapism and wonder that captured the minds of just about every child in the last handful of Western generations. Aside from his questionable love life, Dr. Seuss is still one of the most recognizable faces of childhood wonder. But even fairy tales are not exempt from the throes and pains of the real world. Dr. Seuss's wife of 40 years died by suicide by overdose on October 23, 1967, after a series of illnesses spanning 13 years. She was the primary source of encouragement for and was an editor of her husband's books, even making the initial encouragement that he should be an artist rather than an English professor during their shared time in college. Eight months later, in August 1968, Seuss married Audrey Dimond, with whom he had been having an affair while Palmer was still alive. However, long before his first wife's tragic death, Seuss was still experimenting with communicating the darker facets of life that had made their way into his psyche. Self-portrait of the artist worrying about his next book, created in 1959, is self-explanatory. Seuss had become an established author and cartoonist at that point, following the recent success of The Cat in the Hat and How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and he had been feeling the weight of his heavy crown. His stress and anxiety pursuing his art are seen frequently in these so-called midnight paintings, such as with Cat in Obsolete Shower Bath, a reflection on the cramped one-bedroom apartments and the grungy living conditions that come with being a young artist. The texture is muddied, the colors are drab, and they bleed into one another erratically and blurringly, and the cat in the center is taking the shower with dispersed and meager drops of water. Notably, the cat's tail is pointed down, signaling deep contempt. Indistinct cat with cigar provides an insight into Seuss's smoking problem, something which he vowed to never do in front of children, similar to these paintings which would never see the light of day until after his death. He attempted to quit multiple times, with a more persistent effort following a minor heart attack that he suffered in 1981. Here, the cat looks almost villainous, displaying an air of cunning and malice that likely reflects how Seuss viewed his own lifelong problems with chain smoking. The economic situation clarified, drawn in 1975 after President Ford addressed the nation to declare that the state of the union is not good. Millions of Americans are out of work. Recession and inflation are eroding the money of millions more. Prices are too high and sales are too slow. Depicts dozens of birds rising and falling through the poor economy with expressions to match. Seuss relied on public consumption of his books to make a living, and his life as a young artist provided him with first-hand experience of how cyclical and cynical the rat race would be for all of those who partook. I could go on, but in the interest of brevity, I'll continue on from here. Solar Sands has a fantastic video going far deeper into these secret artworks of Dr. Seuss, and I'll leave a link in the description for those who are curious. Seuss had an incredibly deep private life, one that he kept remarkably separate from the clean-cut and colorful public image he had fostered with his children's books. His midnight paintings provide remarkable insight into the struggles and stresses that he faced regarding his own personality, shortcomings, successes, and the state of the world as a whole. Not exactly depressing, but also not cheery by any means. They're simply real. They're unfiltered glimpses into Dr. Seuss's soul. Experimental works, works with happy colors, abstract works, 
in the aforementioned grim works all paint a picture of a far more complicated man than one would believe without further curiosity. And how could he communicate this unless it was in private? In the form of art. Cuban writer and poet Reynaldo Arenas once wrote, A sense of beauty is always dangerous and antagonistic to any dictatorship, because it implies a realm extending beyond the limits that a dictatorship can impose on human beings. To a dictator and his agents, the attempt to create beauty is an escapist or reactionary act. Both the appreciation and the creation of beauty are, in a certain sense, revolutionary acts, as it is through them that we revolt against the arguably meaningless hardship that life throws at us, the revolt against nihilism. It is through the appreciation of a night sky, a work of art, or that perfect song that we can play on repeat, finding calm amongst the anguishing storm, and truly looking inward. Some would argue that to truly appreciate the good times, you have to go through the bad times. But that doesn't make the onslaught of the bad times any less survivable when you're living through them. Words fall short when trying to communicate the specific extent of your darkness, which, by nature, extends to the cosmic loneliness that you feel. We are, by nature, impossible to understand. And yet, there will be mystery, and mystery brings the potential for beauty, the potential to be human. And through the mystery, we create art, shaping hardship and loneliness into work that inspires, provides catharsis, and makes us feel far more interconnected than words ever could. We put lavish price tags on art, likely partly because of decorative value, but also because of how undeniably human they allow us to feel throughout the progression of human society. Art is made to vent, to cry, to laugh, and to simply put something into the world for others to look upon and see a part of themselves within. John Koenig packed the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows with far more than words one could describe as depressing, like Sonder. Koenig captures the full range of the human spectrum, from love to loss to knowledge to mystery to pain and to the wonder of existence. For everyone who experiences Onism, the awareness of how little of the world you'll actually experience, they will also experience Ambido, those momentary trances of emotional clarity that allow your mind to rest from the weight of mystery and simply enjoy the fleeting and beautiful nature of you and everything about you. You will die, and you will likely be forgotten, but you existed, and you're existing right now. You are, in essence, a cosmic miracle, and nothing is more clear and worth experiencing than that. And even though we may get lost in our anxiety and we overthink and we fall into Okesia, the fear that the role you once occupied in someone's life could be refilled without a second thought, there is always the past and future tingling of Soufriz, the maddening thrill of an ambiguous flirtation, which quivers in tension, leaving you guessing what's going on inside their chest, reminding us that for all of the concrete and suffocating realities of the world, there will always exist love that mysterious and wonderfully maddening ambiguity that makes all of the heartaches of life worth risking again. And even if being human is a heavy ordeal, if Aoki, the anxiety of being an individual, begins to weigh down on you, we will always know the reassurance of Lutalica, the sense that you're more than the categories society puts you in. You tell the world who you are in a million different ways, and frankly, the world is going to ignore or reject many of them. But that doesn't stop you from living the life that you dreamed of from the moment you looked in the mirror and recognized an individual. Yes, we may be the only species to know that we will die, but we are also the only species aware of the incredible chance to be alive, to savor it, to make our own future, regardless of what this cynical universe has to say about it. Sure, Olika, the awareness of how few days are memorable, is a jarring and depressing thing to realize, but how wonderful is it that we have the chance to make days worth remembering in the first place? We can remember decades of our own lives, enjoy the arts and the gifts of the world centuries if not millennia ago, 
cementing our places as unique and worthy individuals amongst a sprawling web of people who have shared this experience of a lonely life on Earth. You are art. You are the lonely soul in the universe looking up into the stars, seeing only your own reflection in the sky. Nocien is described as a moment of awareness that someone you've known for years still has a private and mysterious inner life, and somewhere in the hallways of their personality is a door locked from the inside, a stairway leading to a wing of the house that you've never fully explored. This sense of cosmic loneliness, the fear that you will never truly know yourself or those around you, is terrifying, and yet without it, we would never know the joy of getting to know someone, learning their secrets, the color of their humor, just watching them be themselves and feeling awestruck nonetheless. Nobody knows her in the same way you do. There's only one of her in the universe, and here she is. Sure, you'll never fully know them, not really. And they'll never fully know you. Every word they'll speak will come from bias and experience that you will never truly understand, and they will have more hidden in their subconscious than they will ever have the time or desire to express. And so will you. There will always be a certain distance between us. Maybe the cynics are right and love is only ever an illusion. But maybe it's a sacred kind of illusion, like the shimmering blue gods who appear to shepherd children. It has power, if we believe it does. And that's enough. All that is required is that we keep showing up, and never stop asking each other, what are you thinking about? Sonder and nihilism are the first step of the existential awakening. The failure of communication, the need for art, the worth of our own shared separation, these are the steps to transcend the pitfalls of meaninglessness. But nihilism is not the end, and it was never meant to be. It is nothing more than a painful realization. Albert Camus was many things. An author, political activist, philosopher, aforementioned icon of the depressed teenagers, you get it. And yet, above all else, he was an absurdist. The excerpt I read at the start of this video may have given an impression of nihilism, but in fact, he saw meaninglessness as only a necessary first step in the evolution of peace and true purpose. Camus wasn't some hermit consumed by the despair of existence. He was a soccer superfan. He went out for drinks. He had friends. I mean, he was a ladies' man. He made use of his life. Yes, the world may be absurd. And yes, the universe is silent. And yes, we will never find an inherent meaning to the suffering and chaos that we endure as a species and as individuals. But that is the point. Perhaps we shall be able to overtake that elusive feeling of absurdity in the different but closely related worlds of intelligence, of the art of living, or of art itself. The climate of absurdity is in the beginning. The end is the absurd universe and that attitude of mind which lights the world with its true colors to bring out the privileged and implacable visage which that attitude has discerned in it. Trying to deal with the meaninglessness of the universe by falling into the despair of nihilism doesn't solve the problem at all. It just prevents us from having to deal with it. Camus looked similarly upon religion and ideology, rejecting these as a kind of philosophical suicide. That also tries to sidestep the problem of dealing with an absurd universe by imposing a system on it that will only end up running into the meaninglessness of the universe again and again, while also keeping us from working things out for ourselves. That then, leaves only one option. To embrace the absurdity of the universe as a simple fact. This realization and acceptance of the absurd turn what was an end into a beginning. As explained by writer James E. Carraway, freedom is no longer seen as coming from God or some transcendental being or idea, nor is it freedom to work towards some future goal. Rather, freedom is now seen as founded on the certainty of death and the absurd. 
With the realization that man has only this present life as a certainty, and with the further realization that no transcendent beyond this life is admissible, comes the freedom and release to live the present life fully. Camus suggests that revolting against meaninglessness often leads to what he terms rebellion, which inspires us to seek a unity beyond absurdity and realize that everybody faces the same difficulties in the face of it. Even if we can never truly understand one another, we can understand how impossible to understand we are. We become paradoxically united, and we are no longer alone in the face of death and pain and sorrow suffering, and meaninglessness. When we ask each other, what are you thinking about? It's not about getting an answer to the question. It's the act of asking, of trying to reach across the gap, working through the mystery. That is what's worth holding on to. That's the feeling that must be kept alive, even if we never find the right words to express it. Nihilism and Sonder are the first steps of the existential awakening, what we believe to be the last steps of existence. In our despair, in our inability to understand, to mean something, we find refuge and solace in art and everything that subsides life into something palatable and understandable. And then, with time, we come to Nocien and absurdism. Life is worth something, even if it may logically mean nothing, even if we can never truly know anything, we can know that we know nothing, and by God, that is a great start. Absurdism is the final step of the existential awakening. Absurdism is the first step of true existence. Thank you for watching.